Hello, uh, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the Tourette Association of America's annual conference. Uh, my name is Dr. Kenny Phelps, and I am enthused to be with you here today to talk about procrastination. Really, this notion of, you know, why put off uh, for tomorrow what we could do the next day or the day after that or a week or even a month from then. Certainly a common and human experience for many of us and something that we may see more commonly in folks living with tic disorders such as Tourette syndrome. I'm at the University of uh, South Carolina, as you can see from this slide, in Prisma Health in Columbia, South Carolina. So I'd like to start by just reviewing um, my disclosures. I do some work with the Tourette Association of America, primarily doing some trainings on uh, comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics or CBIT, and then I've helped them some doing some of their CDC talks. Um, and no, today's workshop will not be postponed as you see, um, but would be rather humorous if that happened for a procrastination workshop. So I found this um, online on uh, Etsy, I believe, uh, as something you, that someone could purchase, but it's called Do Morrow. So when I first sent in the title of this presentation, the response I got is, did you have a typo? And I said, no. Um, in fact, Do Morrow is sometimes referenced as the utilization of procrastination, where we put off something until tomorrow and say, nah, you know, I'm not going to do that today. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do tomorrow uh, kind of thing. So our objectives today is we really want to define what we mean when we say uh, procrastination and unpack that definition and talk some about the negative consequences we know that exist when we procrastinate. We're going to talk about the role of executive functioning as well as emotional regulation um, in procrastination. Uh, and then finally, we're going to end by talking through some strategies that I put in the uh, mnemonic acting, where each of those are going to represent a different skill that may help us with procrastination, whether we're a healthcare provider, an individual living with tick or Tourette, um, or family members supporting a person um, who may be struggling with procrastination. So I would like to say, you know, we talk so casually and globally about procrastination um, that it can make it easy to not appreciate the seriousness of how this can impact um, our lives, which is what we're going to talk about in a moment. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, folks were asking, you know, what are you, what are you doing? What are you preparing? And I said procrastination. And universally, this was met with, oh my goodness, yes, I know how that feels, or I definitely do that in my day to day life. But to understand better what we're talking about when we're saying chronic procrastination or trait procrastination, so this is procrastination that happens time after time. I want to look at a definition. Um, and this definition is um, published in a book uh, by Dr. Fuchsia Seurat, who does a lot of this research around procrastination. You'll hear me reference a lot of her um, research as well as uh, the research of Dr. Tim uh, Pitchell in our, in our talk today. But this definition says it's a common self-regulation problem. So when we say self-regulation, really what we're talking about there is managing our thoughts and our emotions and our behaviors. And so this is about, in part, making goals, you know, in the, in the steps to get that goal, like breaking it down into concrete, measurable steps, and then monitoring our own progress in doing that. And so it's not just about making a list and achieving it, but also managing all the internal stuff that comes up, thoughts, emotions, feelings, anxieties, you know, guilt, shame, as well as some of the physical silicone that may come as well. So this might be more ticks or more physical tension when we're approaching a task that might be aversive in some way. Um, so it involves unnecessary and voluntary delay. And what this means is it's something we choose. It's not an external factor. We are putting it off and saying, you know, I'm going to do this tomorrow or the next day. We're not just reprioritizing or it's not that we get sick and we can't do it. Or it's not that an instructor or parent or someone says, well, don't worry about task A. I need you to do task B. This is a choice on our part to put something off. Um, and in part, we know and understand, we recognize that this um, chronic delaying has some negative consequences. People can sort of speak to this will have financial or physical or mental or relational impacts for them. And so they get it cognitively, but emotionally, they still find themselves putting off and procrastinating. So are you prone to procrastination? So could, can you wear this shirt in the bottom right that says I'm a pro 
um, in procrastination? Well, uh, this is a part of a little bit of a quiz or survey in a book by Dr. Sarah that talks about um, you know, what would be some traits or some things we would see in procrastination. So as you can see from the slide, you know, I um, find myself performing tasks I had intended to do days ago, um, or things might require not a ton of effort, but I seldom get them done. I might put them off. I generally delay before I start my work. Um, in preparing for deadlines, I tend to waste time and do some other things. Um, I often wait and buy some time to do something at the last minute. Um, and then finally, I find myself continually saying, eh, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll handle it tomorrow. So all things I think we have some familiarity with when we think about the word procrastination. Well, I mentioned earlier that we, we know and understand that procrastination leads to some consequences. So let's talk through what some of these um, consequences may be. Well, I think the first I want to mention is we know that procrastination um, can lead to poor academic performance. And some of this um, is because when we put off a task, sometimes we have this belief, you know, I perform best in the last minute um, or the last few moments before something's due. But, but often that is not the case because we know what happens when people push the wall of time and they're right up to the mark is that individuals are more likely to engage in academic misconduct. So they're more likely to use that chat GPT. They're more likely to, to copy off someone else's paper. They're more likely to kind of cut corners and what's being required. This doesn't just happen in an academic or scholastic setting, but we know that this can also happen in our work settings. And then the amount of money that is lost in a workplace is staggering based upon an individual's underworking, um, so not working up to their capacity, or cyber slacking, or sometimes what's called in the literature, cyber loafing. And what this means is in the midst of when we're trying to get our work done, we may pivot towards the internet, often this might mean social media, to try to find a respite, but that lasts more time than we would intend. Uh, in fact, social scientists talk about that we really need about 10 minutes if we're doing that to mentally reset and come back to the task at hand. But often we know people spend hours upon hours and devices are designed to do that to keep us engaged. In fact, there's a really interesting research study by uh, Mirak, you can see down here at the bottom in 2015, where they looked at, I believe it was college students who were watching funny cat videos. And you know, one thing that comes on our phones very often are videos of animals. Um, and individuals who were watching those videos actually experienced a great amount of joy and pleasure. Uh, but for those people who were watching the video as a means of procrastination or putting off another task, we actually found they experienced pleasure, but Merrick found afterwards what happened is they experienced a, a lot of guilt and negative feelings surged beyond the initial pleasure that was being felt. So what we know is that when things like this are being used for procrastinating, that they often lead to a guilty pleasure, which is kind of where we use that term um, at times. There are a number of mental and physical health implications of procrastination. Um, so worsening anxiety or depression or rumination, where you sort of get stuck on that negative merry-go-round of thought. Uh, sometimes this sounds like self-criticism, um, like a bully in our brain, um, guilt or shame, you know, about who we are as a person when we find ourselves continuously putting off things that uh, at times may really matter to us. We may express regrets. Um, and then we know that sometimes the negative implication of procrastination may be because of all these mental health symptoms. And sometimes it may actually be because people are putting off medical visits or putting off mental health visits. And then there's an array of physical implications of procrastination, things like um, headache, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. Uh, people can uh, procrastinate their sleep or not get enough sleep because they're staying up trying to get caught up and then a weaker immune system. And of course, as it pertains to today's talk, we may see when we find ourselves having more anxiety and these strong internal emotions, we may also find um, increases in motor tics or vocal tics um, as well. Um, I, I do wanna say that, you know, we exist not in a vacuum, but we exist in relationship. And we know that when we procrastinate tasks that we've committed ourselves to others around, that we may, actually find in um, a negative impact on 
our uh, social lives. And others may begin to think of us as not dependable or can't be counted on, and certainly it can lead to conflict and tension. Um, and then finally, we know that individuals who uh, chronically procrastinate tend to have lower incomes and more unstable employment, so tend to move from job to job if that's not well managed. So why are people procrastinating, right? Why do we find this as being a um, a, a thing that's such a feature in many of our lives. And so pop psychology, sort of what's out there in the media sometimes says, you know, this might be just a problem with willpower or thinking positively, or individuals might lack motivation, or they just um, solely need organizational skills. So we need to teach people how to use a planner effectively. And while that last part may be a small portion of this, I want you to think about that if the task is you in this in this image, sitting down and doing work. Um, and you're thinking about sitting down at that table and getting some work done. Often what we feel is we see, feel some of these things. We feel, ah, oh, this task is gonna be difficult or challenging. Maybe it's not gonna be really too meaningful for me. I might feel like this is boring or stressful. Um, I might feel anxious about the task and um, when I think about doing this task, so the point being, we have strong, intense emotions, which can lead our mood to be in the red zone here, if you think about it like a, a gas tank, right? We're in this red zone, our mood takes a toll, our anxiety goes up, and then ticks um, can often soar as well, too, when we think about sitting down and, and doing that task. Well, what do we do when we find something is aversive or negative? Well, I often say, you know, the best friend of anxiety is avoidance. And so there's this temporal or time trade-off, right? So when something's due in the, on the first, if you look down at the calendar at the bottom right, and we say, let's put it off till the fourth, there's a trade-off. And what we're trading off is I'm going to avoid that task today. I'm going to step away from whatever it is, right? Maybe it's starting a... Um, uh, health regimen of working out, maybe it's cleaning an area of our home, uh, maybe it's calling and having a difficult conversation with a family member or doing an academic or work-based assignment. But we prioritize, um, I've got to kind of feel okay right now in the here and now for basically um, the long-term pursuit of our goals. Or when you think about kind of ourselves a week from now, um, the intriguing thing that's been researched is um, in that moment, on the first, let's say, we're often thinking about our current selves, you know, ourselves on the first. And when we think about ourselves on, let's say, the fourth or on that weekend, we tend to think with the passage of time, we will um, improve, right? We can handle it better tomorrow. You know, the weekend's going to be more relaxing. You know, as time passes, I may have better sense of how to manage this task. So we sometimes tell ourselves a story that it makes sense to put it off a little bit because, you know, we might be able to better handle it down the road or it can wait for, for some reason. So this is sometimes called this time-based thing here, um, a temporal myopia or sort of like time nearsightedness where we tend to think, you know, we might be able to better handle it or make, make a better decision tomorrow or a couple of days from now, or at minimally, like it's so aversive today that I really can't handle that feeling or sitting with that feeling. So I need to find other ways to manage um, that, which might lead us to reach to things like social media, Netflix, things like that, as we'll talk more about. So in uh, psychology in CBT and some other approaches, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, we at times talk about our automatic negative thoughts. These are the thoughts and cognitions that run through our mind. You know, our feelings, don't just pop out of nowhere and we don't just avoid for no reason, but they're often linked to um, these, sometimes we call them ants, um, as because it's like a big ant hill. When you poke it, lots and lots and lots of ants come out. The same thing happens with our mind when we're under stress, right? When we experience stress, we get lots and lots of automatic negative thoughts for ants. So here's some examples we might see of procrastination. Um, I don't know what that thing will be like. That task will take me forever. I don't even know how to do that. Um, it'll be miserable. I know I'll find it boring. Maybe it feels pointless, like it's a waste of my time, um, or I don't really think I'll finish it in time. So we know that tasks are more likely to be procrastinated when we find them to be uncontrollable, 
uncertain in some way, the intolerance of uncertainty, like I don't know what it's going to be like, or we don't think we can complete it in an efficient manner. I also want to say here, though, this would be a whole nother talk that we know that individuals with perfectionism who set very, very high standards or expectations for themselves may be more likely to procrastinate. We also know that individuals who personalize um, mistakes as failures may be more likely to procrastinate as well. So let's talk about some strategies here for um, the remainder of our time. So I love this map. Um, of procrastination. I mean, I think that what we sometimes find is that we're turning to, as you can see, Mount Gaming or the TV Peak um, or Lake Coffee Break uh, or Social Media Forest or online shopping or, you know, my personal favorite, the City of Closet Reorganization. So we may find ourselves turning to to things that really don't align with what we care most about. So let's talk through some strategies that may be helpful um, for yourself, for people you work with, uh, or for people you care deeply about. So the first I'm gonna talk about is the A of acting. So this A is about assessing what is showing up that is making this aversive. Um, and at this point, I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with the iceberg, the, the Tourette Association, uh, put out many years ago um, that shows all the things below the surface that can influence motor tics and vocal tics. Um, many of these things uh, above and below the surface can affect why a task feels aversive. So if part of what we're being required to do in an academic task is writing and we have handwriting difficulties or a tick that's getting in the way um, of our fine motor skills, that may make that aversive. If we find that we're really struggling to attend, right, or we may have something like ADHD, and it's really hard to sit and focus for a length of time of, you know, 30 minutes or an hour, maybe too much is being asked of us to sit for that duration of time to do a task. Maybe the task involves um, interviewing other people or giving a speech or having a hard conversation, and we struggle with social or communication deficits, as you can see below the surface. Um, or maybe this task requires a lot with our executive functions or executive functions, kind of like that administrator in our mind who decides what to prioritize and what to start with and where to begin. Maybe it feels very, very overwhelming. So I think a first thing to slow down and think about is not just assuming this is a problem with time management or your motivation or quote unquote being lazy, but instead slowing down and saying, what is it? about this task that on some level feels aversive in some way that cues an intense surge of emotions inside of myself. Another important part, I think, early on is, um, is naming our emotions. And if you can see right here behind me um, on my uh, speaker screen, I have uh, one of these uh, images in my office because I think a feelings wheel um, or emotions wheel is incredibly important and that naming what's showing up can be really helpful. You know, if we say, you know, I feel perplexed by this task, which is why I think I'm avoiding it, versus, um, you know, I feel despair or I feel loneliness in doing it uh, by myself, uh, or I feel insecure or inadequate in my ability to handle it, right? Those different emotions might lead us to address those feelings in a different sort of way. We also know that Part of accepting our emotions, as you see up here, is not that we are going to make ourselves like the task or want to do the task, but when we name what's showing up, when we name how we're feeling, we can better tame it. You know, there's a, a, a quote I think Dr. Dan Siegel said many years ago, if you can name it, you can tame it. And so I think being able to talk out what's showing up for us helps us avoid those behaviors you see over um, under the iceberg, like rage or behavioral issues, uh, because we can better talk about what's going on for ourselves um, when we're trying to approach a task. So one thing we know, as you heard me mention earlier, that happens for many people um, when they approach a task or are struggling to complete a task is uh, our critic really gets pretty loud. And sometimes this critic is an internalization of a voice we heard when we were really younger from a teacher or coach or parent or someone in our lives. And sometimes we're just um, wired to have a really intense negative voice in our mind. Sometimes this happens before we complete a task. Sometimes it's during a task. Sometimes it's after a task. Um, and 
one thing we're really trying to do is help people realize um, that being hard on yourself, like really chronically and intensely hard on yourself is likely not going to motivate you. It's in fact going to probably lead you to shut down and be less likely to perform that task. So sometimes we're trying to substitute thinking about like from a distancing perspective, like what would you tell a friend in this scenario, right? Or if you spoke to yourself in a kind open way, what would that sound like, right? And so let me give you an example. I wrote a, a note here to, as an example. You know, this task feels really hard and really overwhelming right now. Maybe math has never been my strong suit, or it's really hard for me to motivate myself to, to clean a room. Um, but I know it's going to be hard, so I'm just going to take a few seconds to take a couple deep breath and tell myself I'm just going to start very small. You don't have to try to do all the problems or clean the whole room, but just starting with this small area of the room. Because even getting started on this task uh, might demonstrate skillfulness, right? Take some skill even to just do a little bit if I've not been doing anything at all, right? So it sounds different than you're lazy and what's wrong with you and you never get anything done and you always fail and here you go again, putting something off. You're going to amount to nothing, right? Those sorts of very intense negative narratives tend to be linked with depression and some of the co-occurring conditions we see with Tourette syndrome. So we also want to recognize that um, suffering and struggle is very common amongst all humans, right? So recognizing and naming that we're not alone in this, that people globally struggle with getting things done that feel hard or feel difficult in some way. And then a final step of self-compassion that comes out of Dr. Kristen Neff's work um, is approaching yourself and the task with openness and curiosity. And what I mean by that is we sometimes have a lot of predictions, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, about what it's going to be like, how long it's going to take or how it's going to influence us. So being open to the reality of like we haven't maybe done this task in this way, and so we don't know what it's going to be like or how long it's going to take or what it might um, be challenging. Um, and so we might need to slow it down a little bit and try to approach it with a bit of beginner's mind um, as if we've not approached this task in this exact way in this exact moment. I will say that there's been some writing, uh, as you mentioned, as I mentioned by Dr. Neff on self-compassion, but also Dr. Wall has done some work on self-forgiveness and that in the front end, when we're starting things, we just might want to embody a compassionate stance with ourselves. But on the back end, if we put something off or we don't do something the way we want, um, then we might use more of a self-forgiveness um, narrative. And that might sound more like, you know, I put this off when I needed to complete it. Um, this has caused some unavoidable uh, difficulties, right? I could have avoided these difficulties, but here I am, right? I'm up to the wall, things are due, and, and I missed a deadline, you know, let's say. Um, it won't help me to be rude, unkind, or nasty to myself. So I can do what I can right now to make it right. And let me kind of problem solve to figure out what that might be. And so I can best move forward. So I do want to mention time management. We know that individuals who live with neurodevelopmental um, struggles, things like uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as well as, um, as things like Tourette syndrome, tend to struggle uh, a little bit more with executive function and get overwhelmed by very large tasks. Um, so an example um, of some strategies that can be quite useful come out of the work of um, Dr. Gallagher and colleagues, and it's called OST or organizational skills training. Uh, organizational skills training is about finding a way of keeping um, one list for what needs to be accomplished. Um, I use the app My Task, and I've turned it into a widget on the home screen of my phone, which also links to my iPad, which also links to other technology I use. So anytime I open my phone, I can just kind of see what needs to be accomplished that day. This is a much better strategy than using lots and lots and lots of post-its, um, as you can see on the image uh, here, because we're more apt to misplace something. And the more systems we have, the less likely we are to be able to actually effectively use something. So something like a my task or another kind of um, strategy like that allows you to kind of move things up and down electronically, check things off when you accomplish them and gets it out of your head. Often we're, when we're worried, we carry all this in our head and we feel very overwhelmed and gets us focused on a very concrete uh, technique. It also helps us take a big task and chunk it down to small achievable components. Part of organizational skills training is saying, well, let's make the list. 
let's break it down and then let's prioritize. Let's assign things a one value, a two value, or a three value, or maybe it's an A, B, or C, where the A's are things that have to get done today and the B's or C's are things that might be able to wait until the next day or tomorrow, right? So for helping people with procrastination or helping ourselves in this way, we might think, you know, what are our criteria for saying something's an A versus a B versus a C level task? Because we may be apt to kind of make some things B or C task when they really should be A task. Um, if we're procrastinating. Uh, it can be helpful to also have a monthly calendar so you can see the big picture of extracurriculars or when things are due or um, you know the, the bigger tasks that we might need to chunk and break down in the short term. Uh, we know that one of the things that happens for us in school is that we have lots of different binders or places where we store papers and it can be helpful to have one centralized place. This has months on it, but you might actually have one that represents English, one that represents math, one that represents history, where all the papers go in one space to be, let's say, turned in. And in the back, we might have a folder for papers we've received back. Because when we're just shoving them random places, chances are we're not going to be able to find what we need. And then when we go to do a task, it feels overwhelming and disorganized. So we're more likely to procrastinate. Um, and then finally, sometimes when we have those automatic negative thoughts, like this will take forever, right? Or, oh, it's going to take me all afternoon. It can be helpful to track how long you think it will take you. So maybe we think it will take us two hours versus how long it actually uh, took us. And so that can be helpful if we find that it actually does take us a lot less than we initially anticipated. So um, the I is being really intentional about your context. And what I mean by that is the environment that you're trying to get whatever this is done. And so we can imagine if I'm trying to get work done here, it's going to be easier to make that happen than if I'm trying to get work done here. Um, or if I'm trying to make better choices um, for my health and for my body, if my refrigerator looks like this, which I don't know anybody's refrigerator, it looks completely like that, but it's going to be a lot easier than if on our kitchen counter, it looks like this. Um, so the point of this being um, that we want to try to minimize the cues, the visual cues in our environment that prime us for actions. Um, that make us more likely to choose procrastination over other things. So we want to make it easier to make the choice we want to make. And so the most concrete example of this is, you know, if we're taking breaks on our phone, it might not be the greatest idea to have our phone sitting right there next to us while we're trying to get something accomplished, because any kind of alert or video is going to pop up and grab our attention, uh, which is what it's designed to do. Or if you find yourself really enjoying um, one of the uh, examples used in um, one of the texts was uh, playing a guitar, let's say, or playing music. You, know, you might not want to do your work right in the room where your guitar is sitting next to you because it's going to be really easy when you approach that task and feel a great degree of emotional dysregulation and, oh, I feel the aversive feelings come up to reach for that guitar to self-soothe. And before we know it, we've put off the task and we've been playing guitar for quite some time. So we want to make it easier to make the right kind of choice. We also know that we can be interrupted by other people. So family members, friends who reach out and call us and say, hey, you want to go do this or do you want to go do that? And one thing Dr. Uh, Sarah, one of the big researchers on procrastination says um, is it can be helpful to develop an if then plan. So if someone invites me to do something, then I will have this that I'll say, or if someone wants me to go jump on the video game, then I will say, hey, I can do it at eight o'clock, but I can't do it at six o'clock. You know, uh, can you guys hold off and, and wait for me? Um, so the idea here is that we're trying to create an environment that's conducive to making um, the choice that aligns with our goals and our values and who we want to be. So being intentional. Um, finally, uh, you heard me mention earlier, it's important to notice and name some of the biases that come up. And we all have a certain biases that, uh, that we uh, manifest. An example is, uh, as humans, we often find ourselves mind reading. So imagining what other people think of us when we're giving a talk or we're standing up in front of a group. But when it comes to procrastination, there's a couple other biases that we see happening that are along the lines of being a fortune teller, kind of thinking towards the future, because we're we're thinking about this task that we need to do today or tomorrow. And we often have what's called an intensity bias. So a bias that my this is going to feel so horrible to do. 
Um, and we imagine it's usually going to be a bit harder than it actually is when we sit down to do it. Another one is called a durability bias, meaning that this distress we feel, these emotions we feel is going to last a lot longer than they actually do if we step back and actually and track what happened um, in the task. So we tend to think towards the negative. We're wired to do that as mammals. Um, and we tend to overestimate to keep ourselves safe and comfortable in our day-to-day -day lives. So it can be helpful to use some perspective taking and identify um, our future selves. So um, I saw a young person the other day um, who we'll just call uh, Mary. And, uh, and, and Mary was really trying to, uh, to go for some walks because she knew that going for walks and being in nature really helps with her tics and helps with focus and she can come back in and do better work. But sometimes she'll sit inside and have thoughts like, oh, I don't feel like going for a walk or we're in South Carolina, so it's hot outside or, you know, the dog's going to um, pull me down the road if I try to take the dog with me. So there are a lot of uh, negative thoughts and strong feelings of avoidance um, that creeped in and it was easier just to kind of sit and watch Netflix. So one thing that Mary and I did was um, close our eyes and imagined ourselves thinking about, uh, if this was at three o'clock, thinking about what, let's say, um, eight o'clock Mary or tomorrow Mary would say to her if she went for a walk. Sometimes I use this personally when I'm like, oh, I don't feel like going for the run or going to the gym. You know, what would afternoon Kenny say to this morning Kenny? And often an element of that is, you know, oh, I feel so much better, or I'm glad I did that, or I feel more productive, or I feel like I could better accomplish other things that matter to me. Um, but it's something encouraging, and it's to remind us of kind of the reason for all this in the in the first in the first place. They've actually um, done a number of research studies that look at sometimes people capture this uh, this um, perspective taking by doing letter writing, so writing a letter to your future self. Um, that might feel a little better after some of the task is completed tomorrow or the next day or a week from now, and then writing a letter back to yourself as well. There's been a lot of this research that's uh, been done with college students um, or folks that are making that transition to independence and managing all their own work. Um, and when they uh, sort of think about what their future self would say, that can be pretty helpful um, in day-to-day -day life. Finally, the G, you know, if we're thinking about this as we're really trying to go on a journey and uh, and accomplish goals, goals are uh, like the points along the way on this road trip where values really are, are like our compass that tells us what direction to go. Uh, this values list comes from the work of Dr. Brene Brown, who's done a lot of research on um, guilt and shame. And one thing we know about guilt and shame is that um, when we tend to put off a task afterwards, some of us feel guilty, right? Like, um, oh, I shouldn't have put that off, right? And, and that's causing me a lot of problems now. And, you know, I need to try to remediate that and do that differently next time. But some of us feel shame. And shame is when we make it less about our behavior and we make it more about our personality or who we are, right? Like, I'm lazy or I'm worthless or I'm a failure. And those leaps from behavior. Um, to our personalization of it tend to be pretty problematic and cause us to be more likely to procrastinate in the future. So one thing to kind of keep an eye on is that negative voice of trying to move it from criticism to compassion, as we've talked about, but also to think about the, the why, you know, why does this task matter to you? Um, and perhaps it has nothing to do with um, the task at hand, but maybe your bigger goals that this may be linked to. You know, so maybe if we accomplish this task, that we would have more time to spend with our children or with our partner or with our friends and people we love, let's say, and we'll be less preoccupied by all these things. Sort of that behind the scenes distress that lives under the surface won't be with us in those moments um, as much. Maybe it's um, having some um, balance in our lives and realizing that if we don't get this accomplished now, we know that what we're doing is postponing it down the road when it's going to probably exacerbate ticks and lead us to feel more distressed and lead to intrusive thoughts. Uh, maybe we're working in a group project and it's about teamwork or collaboration. Um, maybe it's trying to work on controlling or managing our environment more. And it's not about this task I'm completing right now, but 
I feel calmer when my environment's more calmer. But ideally, values cross-cut lots of situations. And so I always encourage when I work with the rising leaders uh, with the Threat Association uh, initiatives to, to think about their values and think about what really, really matters to them, um, because it can be a guiding light in the midst of a lot of uh, distress and a lot of struggles. So here are uh, my references from today's talk. And what I really would like to end with is um, some of the resources that I cited and, and some helpful strategies um, that I talked about that you could read a lot more about on your own uh, if you're so interested. Uh, the book you see to the left um, by Dr. Fuchsia Sarah and Dr. Tim um, Pitchell is titled Procrastination, Health and Well-Being. I would say this is more of an academic text that really breaks down a lot of the research about how procrastination affects our physical, emotional, uh, and social health. A really how-to guide um, by Dr. Sirach entitled Procrastination, What It Is, Why It's a Problem, and What You Can Do About It, is the green book you see here that really talks through a lot of the information I discussed today in much greater detail. Um, she was interviewed on the Speaking of Psychology podcast, which you see down here at the bottom by the American Psychological Association. Uh, and that's a good resource just to learn about lots of things as it pertains to mental health. Uh, Dr. Pitchell uh, actually had a podcast uh, that I don't believe he's recording anymore, but um, in the late 2000 teens, I think it was 2017, 18, 19, uh, called the I Procrastinate podcast, where he uh, talks a lot about procrastination and how we can better understand it. Um, there are some uh, treatment workbooks. Uh, one's called Overcoming Procrastination for Teens. There's kind of a self-help book for parents that's less about procrastination and more about the elements of executive function and time management that you heard me reference by Dr. Gallagher and colleagues called The Organized Child. And then one resource we're often thinking about is um, Smart But Scattered, which also talks about some of those strategies to get organized and stay focused and learn from um, our mistakes. You can also see my information down here at the bottom right. Feel free to reach out via email. That's probably the best way to reach me. And I think we're gonna um, have some time now just to talk through uh, some of your questions. And I really do appreciate you for attending um, this. And I hope we can all raise some awareness about ticks and Tourette's syndrome in the coming month.